Before I introduce Tom, I will just talk about Helios a little bit for those of you who aren't familiar with Helios. Helios is a mental health company. We work with children, young people, young adults and families up to the age of 25. And we work with the National Health Service. We provide therapy services uh, to the, the NHS. Um, and coincidentally, Tom is also an NHS therapist. But I'm going, to, uh, <laughs> I'm going to let Tom introduce himself now. So welcome, Tom. Thank Would you. you like to tell us who you are? Uh, yeah, I'm Tom Finlay. I'm, um, I am a, music, a musician and a therapist. So mm -hmm. um, I've been told that's called a slashy. We've just yeah. been talking about this. But so, yeah, I've been uh, in a band called Groove Amada for nearly 25 years, started in mm -hmm. 1997. I live here in London, mm -hmm. just around a corner from your office. Yeah. I've got a couple of kids, uh, Alfie and Pearl, 18 and 15, 16, married to Jess. And I've been a therapist, like actually practicing therapy for about a year and a half, but I mm -hmm. guess I've been training for six or seven years in mm -hmm. terms of where I kind of started. So um, yeah. Yeah, that's all quite new to me. Yeah. yeah. So would you say you're more famous as a therapist or a musician right now? <laughs> Definitely a musician. So mm. um, uh, I'm not sure that I'm really seeking fame as a therapist. I kind <laughs> of enjoy in a lot of ways, you know, as you know, like when it's not really that appropriate to bring a lot of yourself into therapy anyway. So I mm. quite enjoy the anonymous, what's the word? Being anonymous. I'll try. Uh, Being uh, anonymous in therapy. That's such a difficult <laughs> word, but that one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So... Um, Take us back to um, to the early days of your career. How did it start? How did Groove Armada start? Um, so yeah, I mean, it started um, just out of university. I went to the University of Manchester, um, and I was kind of always involved in music at that time. I was DJing quite a bit. I played in a few kind of pretty awful bands. I spent some time in New York and I DJed there. So it was always a real passion for me. Um, I'd never really seriously thought about it as a career. I moved down to London like a lot of people my age did and carried on with that. And I was DJing. I was mm. um, started releasing records on a label called Tummy Touch, which is still going, and uh, putting on parties in Shoreditch, a kind of much rougher version of Shoreditch than the one that we think of now, you know, a real warehousey sort of space. And I met Andy around that time. I went to school with his now wife. And she introduced us and said that you two should would get along and have a common interest and stuff. And yeah, we started writing. He was um, he was already writing tons of music and he had a tiny little studio. He's super, super musical. I'm a kind of, uh, you know, I, I'm sort of an enthusiast rather than, than a kind of real expert in terms of music. So I loved... Um, I loved music, I was a real collector, so we used to come together and I'd sort of bring little samples or new loops or ideas and he would do the engineering and play on top of it and we started putting out these 12 inches and it kind of actually happened really quickly for us. Like we had probably about six or seven EPs, so like the kind of extended plays, like four or five tracks, this is all vinyl of course. Um, and you know, we were DJing in clubs and putting on parties in quite a sort of minor way. And then we went away for a week to a place called Ambleside in the Lake District and we recorded our first album, which is called Northern Stars. It's like 95, 96. And on that album was a track called At The River, which is a really, was kind of our kind of breakout record. Um, me and Andy still row about who wrote the riff. And now I'm here, I can say that I wrote it. But <laughs> he does play the trombone and he actually played it. And, um, and that was when, and then things sort of took off really quickly from there. And that kind mm. of became like, I remember like music magazine, Tune of the month, and then on album of the month, and then we got signed a few weeks later by Jive Records. We were label stable mates with Steps. They were the only other band on yeah. our label, so that couldn't be more different. And things happened really, really quickly in a way that I think would be harder now. You know, with so much, I think the kind of gestation period for artists is a bit longer now. For mm. us, it was like, yeah, we were probably writing together for a year, eighteen months, and like three years after that, we were driving around in New York in limousines and doing all that sort of stuff. It happened, it really mm. accelerated quite quickly. So, mm. um, so yeah, it's all a bit of a blur, but, but we were very lucky. And I think it was that weird time where, you know, there were fewer people making music mm. and it was fewer people had access to technology. Mm. There was a kind of small cabal of A&R, and they were largely men, I have mm. to say at that time, signing music. So, yeah, it, it, was, it, it, it didn't feel as hard as it should have been, really. I think mm. we were quite lucky. 
And you were telling me about uh, your Manchester Uni days. Um, what mm. did you study at uni? Something completely pointless. Like, and, and no very smart. I did American studies. Okay. But I, I just wanted to do it because I, I grew up loving America and I loved the music that came out of America. And I'm a real mm. kind of soul music fan and funk and disco. So I always kind of looked that way for my kind of musical mm. influences. So America was always an inspiration. And I got to, in American studies, you get to spend a year in an American college. Mm. So, so it was all really accidental. Uh, I, don't, I can't, still can't work out how I got there. But yeah, I got to spend a year in, in New York. Um, I lived in a town called Hicksville when I was there. <laughs> and, and I was the only white man that lived on campus. It was not what I anticipated at all. And a really fascinating place called Old Westbury College. But I spent about three, four months there. And then they let me, I wasn't really learning a lot at that place at that time. And so me and a friend moved down to Soho. And then I spent mm. like six, seven months promoting clubs and stuff mm. over there, which is amazing. Um, so from from the, the hacienda to New York in uh, quite yeah. quite a short time. Really, and and such amazing. I mean, it was a real like golden age of, of mm. dance music. Really, like the hacienda was in its pomp when I was in Manchester. I spent pretty much most of my well every sat literally every Saturday night mm. in my second year there because it was that thing where that's just what you did. You went to the hacienda mm. on a Saturday night, and yeah, the club scene was 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 obviously amazing in New York and really good when I got back to London. So I mean, it's still mm. great now, but I definitely remember that as a as a as a, as a kind of heady time. Yeah. Mm. Do you think the club scene has changed? Yeah, I think it's gone through. I mean, you know, obviously since then to where we are now, it's mm. like twenty five years. I probably was, you know, my I've been kind of. I think it's gone through loads of different changes. You know, it it, it was a kind of very sort of intimate experience when I started out and there was all these kind of little basement bars in Shoreditch and Dawson and they're still there. Mm. Um, in the last few years, I think sort of partly the influence of Ibiza that's gone very big and super glammy, but also this sort of, there's a real kind of warehouse thing that's really mm. happening now. So there's a really great up, event up in Manchester called the Warehouse Project. And it seems to be this idea of like, and I, and I don't, and I do the gigs every now and then, I don't DJ anything like as much as I used to now of people wanting to come together in sort of large groups and that real sense of celebration. And that's, that's a really lovely thing. But there's also tons of great small clubs. I just don't go to them anymore. Mm. Far too old. So, and we were talking about um, the, the, why, why do people go clubbing? What's therapeutic about clubbing? And I, and I suppose what's the golden thread, you know, from t 25 years ago, clubbing at the ha Hacienda and now, you know, why, why is it still attractive to people? Yeah. I mean, I think it's... Um, you know, there's, there's kind of just a visceral thrill of being in a crowd and the music. People just love the music. I mean, I, mm. you know, like I, I'm not one of these people that can really go home and listen to dance music at home. I find it a, a bit triggering. But I think being in, mm. a, in, a, in a room on a, on a great set of speakers, listening to music that you love, is just mm. an, an amazing experience. And, you know, the kind of sense of togetherness, you know, I kind of, uh, you know, the, most, of my, most of my best friends I probably met in nightclubs at one point or other, or certainly spent a lot of time together in nightclubs, and friendships were sort of really forged on the dance floor, you know. So mm. that, that um, and you know, I guess your inhibitions come down in, in, a, in a moment like that, and maybe you talk more openly about yourself and some of your difficulties, and all this stuff comes back to therapy, I guess, in mm. some way. But there's a kind of an openness to experience, and I guess probably a sense of a lot of people who come together in those kind of experiences have a sort of shared set of values a bit. And, um, you know, people are probably pushing against norms a bit more. Mm. So whatever it is, it's, um, yeah, I've, you know, I have formed like really lasting bonds on the dance floor. So, so what you're talking about quite a lot is how music makes you feel or how it makes people feel. And mm. you also said that listening to dance music at home is a bit triggering. So that's an immediate kind of relationship between how you feel and sound. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, I, and then, you know, and I'm... I'm I, I mean, I love, I, exactly, I think that's, it, 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 I, I find it in terms of my kind of emotional experiences, I think that music's by far the most powerful thing for me, you know, like I can, I can put on a playlist that I love on a Saturday night, I can immediately lift my mood just by listening to that, and, um, and you know, or I can listen to like a bit of Miles Davis jazz and somehow transport myself to Paris in the 1960s, it, mm. it's very evocative for me, it's by far the most, the kind of most powerful medium that I kind of relate mm. to, uh, unquestionably. Mm. So let's start to go down that journey of when your music career sort of expanded and you decided to look into therapy and uh, you became curious about therapy. What, what were the triggers to those? Yeah, moments? I mean, I think it was sort of uh, kind of 97s when things started for me. And I think the sort of 10, 15 years after that, probably about 13 years, everything is 
just a kind of like it like it's life on fast forward and everything's fairly mad and um we were just everything was kind of positive and we were releasing records and being successful and everything felt like there was a sense of purpose and direction and I wasn't really questioning anything you know it was just this is what you wanted to do and you release an album and you toured it and you hope it got played on the radio and you did that again and that was a cycle mm. that we did pretty relentlessly up to an album we did called Love Box which is which is the name of the festival that we then founded. And at that point, we kind of seemed to hit the buffers a little bit. And I think that was partly creatively, but more just our relationship with the label. And we felt like we would just felt like things weren't quite working as seamlessly as they had before. And then really, we then fell out with our label, kind of got dropped with our label, which actually was a blessing really. Uh, in a lot of ways, because they, they'd lost interest and most of the people that we'd signed with, you know, 10 years ago weren't there anymore. So we were being handled by people that we didn't have that relationship with. Um, and then, yeah, we came to an album called Black Light, which we released ourselves um, and came out on a label called Cooking Vinyl, but we essentially put it out ourselves. And that just became a kind of moment where I, I kind of personally also slightly hit the buffers. Mm. And I was spending a lot of time away from my family you know we were I was writing that album and he had moved to France at that point um just living in this big house in absolutely in the middle of nowhere in southwest France really isolated and I found that quite difficult being away from my family and not being so sure about anything the kind of sense of of just having a real sense of purpose and focus and knowing where things were going I'd kind of all of that I'd sort of lost that mm. and a bit of panic about maybe things creatively weren't as fluid as they'd been before and so all that stuff kind of came together and I think whenever people have you know depressive episodes in their life it's often not one thing but it's a kind of a number of things that come together and it kind of overwhelms your coping mechanisms and your ability to manage stuff a bit and I and I think all of that stuff to come together you know that kind of like I said the kind of physical isolation being away from my family sort of not really knowing where I was going in my career and panicking a little bit about mm. what I was doing creatively, whether I still had it, whatever it was, whether we still had it, whether we mattered, all that kind of, all these kind of existential questions as well. Uh, so it fell into a bit of a depressive episode, really. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't actually, and I think it's a thing again, you know, this is, that's 2010, 2011. So it's like things weren't, mental health wasn't talked about in the way it is now. And obviously you think that's, the way we now talk about now is a, is a really great thing and that we can I can talk about this now and feel comfortable about it you know it's not easy because it brings back memories of stuff that was good times that were very difficult for me but I don't feel like it's a stigma and it definitely felt like there was a stigma about it at the time so I wasn't even aware of what it was so I think I was probably probably depressed for like a year and a half before I actually got any kind of help and so I was just sort of making do and you know and now looking back on it all the symptoms I had were, were just all the classic symptoms that people would have in depression, but lots of rumination, constant rumination, but, you know, struggling with sleep and low mood and was all that sort of stuff. And, um, but yeah, it took me like 18 months before mm. I got help and I got, and I had um, CBT and like no, no diss to my therapist at the time, but it wasn't the best CBT. Now, now I know what CBT was, but it really, you know, just, kind of chuck leaflets at me basically which I know we do a bit of in CBT but uh, I found them really helpful leaflets and it and it was um and I made those connections quite quickly and it really helped me and I started reading and and a lot of the reading really helped me and that kind of was where my interest mm -hmm. into sort of therapy grew really. So just for people who don't know CBT is cognitive behavioral, behavioral therapy, therapy yeah. and cognitive means thinking yeah. and behavioural is how we behave and mm. we all know I think what therapy means so yeah. we refer to it as CBT and it's the, one of the most dominant therapeutic models certainly in the UK and in the US yeah. um, but just when you described hitting the buffers as you mm. call it uh, and then how you described what happened sounded a bit like what's been going on in the last 15, 18 months, sound, it sounded like yeah. how people have been experiencing the pandemic and exactly. all those questions musicians who haven't had a chance to perform mm. or be with their colleagues and have felt isolated. They must mm. have been going through the same kind of questioning. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you've been through it yourself in the last few months, but certainly when we interviewed We Are Hummingbird last time, they very much talked about how the pandemic had impacted musicians. So. Yeah. You, you've kind of had your own personal hitting the buffers mm. and then the music industry, has it hit the buffers, do you think, through the pandemic? Uh, 
I think the, the recorded music industry is doing amazingly well. I mean, like streaming figures are up. So the kind of people that were doing well out there, it's a bit like, you know, Amazon doing well or Jeff Bezos, all these people who are making tons of money and making even more money. But I think for people working in the live music industry, it's been in the mm. event side of things, it's been terrible. And they're the people that I feel most connected to, you know, they're the kind of people that, you know, that I have, have had more relationships with that set of people. So yeah, so the people who are running festivals or, you know, people who are working in crews or in tech or session musicians have really struggled. I mean, they're resourceful people. And certainly my experience of, you know, I'm going to be doing a couple of gigs again in a couple of weeks time and getting together with all those people again, which is going to be lovely. But they're a lot of them, they've become like truck drivers or, you know, they've mm. used their skills in different ways. They've made it work but mm. um but yeah it's been it's been really really challenging and i think you know so much of your i think the thing that that has been hardest for me is the sort of my connection to other people and the kind of variety of life that i was experiencing in music was removed and i found that really difficult and i had you know every social experience we had became so intentional you know you had to really make an effort let's go for a walk next thursday or whatever rather than those random sort of social experiences that i used to really enjoy like you know, jumping on a plane to Ibiza and bumping into old faces I hadn't seen. And that's losing all of that, I found really difficult. I mean, I, I'm partly, I guess, because of my training and partly because where I am, I didn't ever feel depressed. I might have had days where I was sort of, things were harder for me, but I wouldn't relate that with what I would now call depression. You know, I just, things are a bit tough in a way that I think lots of people are finding mm. things difficult. Um, and I suppose maybe for you, one of the differences between the last 15 months and the time that you hit the buffers is this time around, you um, have had so much sense of purpose mm. with, with your two dual careers, yeah. whereas the last time around you were questioning yeah. the music in the, your music career. Yeah, yeah. It, it's definitely it's helped with some of the, the existential questions, definitely. And also the thing that where I am now in my music career, I'm like, you know, very much in the twilight of my career. The last album was called Edge of the Horizon for a reason, you know, we don't, so I don't, I think 10 years ago, I was really worried about where we were going, where we were heading, and probably a lot of, you know, thing that I think as a musician you have to be really careful of is, is comparing yourself to other people. Like, we call it like compare and despair in CBT, <laughs> but really avoiding some of those unhelpful mm. habits of thinking, you know. And so sort of looking at other people and not being able to even enjoy other people's success and all that sort of stuff where, now I'm a bit more wizened, a bit longer in the tooth. I can, I can be really relaxed about that stuff. I can actually have managed to enjoy music in a way in the last five years in a way that I hadn't before because it was a career and I found it quite hard to listen to music. It wasn't mm. something that I associated with being particularly pleasurable all the time, you know? Mm. So let's go back to just, you know, you hit the buffers, you got some help. Yeah. It was harder then to talk about yeah. depression than it probably is now, yeah. but you somehow got yourself to some help. Yeah. You must have had a moment of realisation. Do you, do you want to talk about that at all? Yeah, I mean, I think it was, I was quite lucky in the sense that, sense that Andy, who's my partner in the band, was actually, you know, really supportive. And I'm not I know, on a kind of an emotional level, definitely, but actually on a practical level, because mm -hmm. I wasn't really, at that time when we wrote that record, I was struggling a bit, and he really stepped up and kind of basically sort of finished the record. I just had to step away from it by the end of it. And, and that was great. And actually, I, you know, I love that record and, you know, it's called Black Light. And, and, and when I listen to it, I can, I can picture, you know, that brings me back. It's very, it can be very difficult, some of the songs. I can remember standing in studios feeling utterly lost and bereft. And, and so it brings all that back. But it's kind of been in a kind of bittersweet sort of way. I can listen to the record now. I'm really proud of the record. It's probably as a, as a piece of work, as a kind of a collection of songs, it's probably the best. I feel it's like the best record we ever made. I think it's not all the hits when people think of I See You Baby and At The River, they're not on that record, but I love that record. And then we, um, <clears throat> we toured that, found a new band and a new way of playing, and I loved playing that record live. And I started really enjoying that and touring. And yeah, I think with about, by the time we were back out on the road, I was, I was kind of much better. I, I was in a much, much better place and really enjoyed it. And I think we had a set of people around us at that time that were were better for me, I think, mm. you know, I think the, the previous band were, could be quite a difficult group of people at times, you know, mm -hmm. and I think this set people were a much more supportive group. And that's the thing, you know, like when you're touring and when we were doing the touring that we were doing at times, I was probably with a group of people, that same set of people on and off planes, trains and automobiles for two, three, four months at a time. You know, mm. we do Australia into the United States. And if you're not 
with a really nurturing, supportive group of people. Mm. And that can be in their own different ways. It doesn't mean we have to have fireside chats every night, but just people that know when to lift you and know when to, like, to say the right thing at that right moment. And they were, uh, they were really like that. They're, and it's pretty much the same group of people I play with now, which mm-hmm. is lovely. So that connection with that group of people sounds yeah. very healthy. And yeah. then you had the therapeutic, the therapeutic input as well. Um, yeah. And I guess uh, a chance to reconnect with your family, I would imagine, at some yeah. point along the way. Um, yeah. And then when did all that turn into, I'm curious about training to be a therapist? Yeah. I mean, I think that came quite once we had that. So we, we rushed around, really enjoyed touring that album. We did a lot of that and we went out to the States and Australia. I think it was an album we're really proud of. And I guess we probably finished touring that about 2013. At that time, Andy, and he's really passionate, was getting very into regenerative farming. That's his mm-hmm. organic farming then, but it's now regenerative farming. And so he was really, really focused on that. And I was a bit like, I need an interest. I need another interest because this is not now his primary focus anymore. And that's fine. That took me a bit of adjustment. Um, and yeah, and I've, I've been reading anyway, tons about it. And uh, I thought, yeah, I'd, I'd start doing a, I didn't know whether I'd be very good at therapy. I think at that time I was so self-absorbed that I didn't know whether I'd be very good in listening to other people's problems. But I thought I'd give it a whirl. So I did like a, an intro to counselling course for a year at Birkbeck. Didn't hate that. And then I then thought, well, maybe what I want to do is something a bit more serious, a bit more professional. So I then did an MSc in psychology at the UEL, which I really enjoyed, actually. I really enjoyed, apart from the statistics, I really enjoyed it. <laughs> that was horrific. And then I did, um, and then I came straight out of that, realised that sort of clinical psychology was going to be a bit too much for me, and I didn't mm. quite... But I, we, we sort of looked at different um, domains, you know, areas of therapy. We looked at psychodynamic and we looked at CBT and we looked at person-centered when we did the psychology. And CBT was the one that continued to speak to me and mm. made the most sense to me. And I quite like the idea that you can be quite bossy in CBT. It's like one of the therapies where, you know, we talk about it being very collaborative. It's mm. a sort of teamwork. We're kind of shoulder to shoulder with people. You're allowed to intervene. You're allowed to suggest stuff. You get your whiteboard out. And I'm quite like that anyway. So I thought this is a therapy that really speaks to me. I can talk about my experiences of it and what worked for me. Mm. And, um, and so I did uh, two years at the University of Hertfordshire. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, and then did training at King's College London. I did training, but that's doing my hours. And I worked at a place called the Hackney Centre for Better Health, which was also good and got my 200 hours or whatever. And then... Um, Somebody who my name has helped me out with, um, with getting an opportunity at NHS, which has been great. Um, so you've said a bit of why cognitive behavioural therapy appeals to you. It's, yeah. And it's also quite structured, isn't it? It is. And, it, and it's a really quite, quite a clever therapy, Yeah, I think. It's got some smart ideas uh, mm. behind it. Um, and I'm wondering if you'd like to, I'm not trying to test you yeah, here, right, yeah. <laughs> but I'm wondering if you'd like to just kind of, what are your favourite bits of the therapy? Which bits do you love, the tools that you love using? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I have to force myself to do the structure stuff more. Like, and I, and I, obviously when I'm trained, you know, like, so CBT is very structured. So, you, you know, you're supposed to start every session with an agenda and, you know, you look for like two or three items and you're looking to set bits of homework for people between sessions that might be, you know, a bit of reading, or it might be like you come up with like a behavioural experiment, how are you going to do something different this week? And I like that stuff, but I do have to force myself to use the structure. I think I, I love, I think the kind of, the, the kind of, the, you know, the, the, the way that we connect, I mean, the obvious thing, as you said, mm-hmm. the answer's in the name, but the way we look at the way, the kind of, the way we connect our thoughts and our behaviours and how we look at kind of vicious cycles and maintenance cycles, that really speaks to me. It's the idea that, you know, if you're in this kind of, a particularly depressed mood state you might think quite negatively about yourself and the world and in turn you might therefore disengage from other people or pull back from activities that are meaningful to you i think that's really obvious when you think about it but it, it makes a lot of sense so it's a that's it's a thinking therapy but it's a doing therapy too so i, I like that stuff where you can help people connect that up and it seems so kind of obvious when you say to people Look, maybe if you just rang a friend this week or you know, I went swimming a couple times this week and you can see people's mood shifts. And so I like the fact that you can help people make emotional changes in their life without necessarily having to go in too deep and, and sort of dig into their past or their relationship with their mother. And I like that sort of top down way that CBT works. Mm-hmm. I like the way that we, you know, the kind of core beliefs So this idea that we have a certain sort of central belief about ourself, um, you know, and that 
affects the way that we meet the world. We call that kind of rules and assumptions. I think they're really clever and helping to people to think about that and to think about what their rules are and whether they can adjust their rules in ways that can be more adaptive in the therapy mm-hmm. world, more helpful to them, you know. Um, so I think it's, it, it is a really clever therapy. It's really well thought out. And I'm, there are bits of it that I think work better than others, you know, and there are certain disorders that I enjoy more than others. I know that sounds mm-hmm. a bit odd, but like, um, but you know, like depression and anxiety, I love working with. OCD, I struggle a bit more with. Social anxiety, I struggle a bit more with because I find it harder to relate to those experiences because I've not had them, you know. Mm. Whereas I've had plenty of anxiety in the past in terms of performance stuff and I've had lo- lots of depression or periods of depression, as mm. I told you. So I, it's, I, I find those bits easier. But uh, yeah, I think it's a really smart therapy. I think it's, I like the... I like the notion of working with somebody in a partnership. I think that's something I'm more comfortable with. And as I said to you, I like the idea that you can interrupt and you can make suggestions. You know, I look at like the person-centered stuff and I know that I would just be fighting off my <laughs> hand just having to listen to people, you know, find their way back mm. to, to kind of some healthy state. Whereas I find the, yeah, I find the collaborative nature, the kind of hands-on nature of CBT really enjoyable. The way you describe working with a patient reminds yeah. me of the way you describe working with your music partners. Yeah. It's that kind of collaborative back and forth. Absolutely, yeah. And very creative. It sounds like you're, you're a creative therapist. Yeah. I in like the moment, that. kind of, I'm going to do this. No, I'll, I'll do that and then we'll go there. And Yeah. yeah. And, I think, and I, think that's, I think that's great. And I think that's why I do need to force the structure on myself, because I think the structure can be really helpful for people. Like, we do this thing in CBT, I'm, you know, like you know this, but I'm saying that mm. we talk about formulation and that's a way of, of a kind of a shared understanding of somebody's problem, you know, and you can do that in lots of different ways, you know, like they call like, you know, like the thing I told you, and we might just draw, draw a kind of semicircle where we look at thoughts, emotions and behaviours and physical sensations, so a very simple one, or we might do something much more complex and we're looking at kind of core beliefs and, and you know, bringing a lot of their past experiences into it. Or we do this one like a vicious flower, which is literally a flower with these different petals of the different things that are maintaining the problems in their life. And I kind of got them all in my head because I'm the therapist, but I have to remember that people don't have those. And actually when I force myself to do the formulations with people and to draw those problems out and to do it in a graphic way, I can see how helpful that is for somebody who's just been going around and around the same issues in their life to see them visually and to say well look if we could make that change here and we could take, stop doing that so the, the vicious flower one is quite good because you can start pulling the petals off mm. a flower or and so I think they're really good the formulation stuff is good but I I do I'll go through periods that I realize I've done three sessions where I've not done an agenda and I get a bit cross to myself it's why it's really good actually working with the NHS because the NHS is has to be very structured you know and we have to show um, you know, good recovery rates and stuff like that. It's really important. The funding's based on that. And, you know, they're on you every time about, you know, I, I did an audit the other day. Mm-hmm. I didn't know what that was. I didn't know. And I suddenly realized, because I was thinking, does anyone ever read my notes? And then I realized that actually, yes, they do. Every year they read your notes and they look at how structured you're being. And, and I think that stuff is really important. And, and I think that, if, I think it's for people whose lives feel chaotic and, and uh, you know, out of control, then trying to help some structure you know, bring some structure to, to their ways of thinking can be really helpful. Yeah, that's, that's good. So, so you're working in the NHS, you're mm-hmm. working in adult mental health services. I am. We don't need to say exactly where, but I know yeah. we wanted to have a little... I should give them props. I work for Barnet IAPS. I check with go. them that it's okay <laughs> to mention them. They'd be really disappointed if I don't. So, so yeah. you, you work for Barnet, Enfield and Haringey Mental Health I do, Trust yeah, in, yeah. The, in the adult services, the yeah. IAPS, it's yeah. called, so I do it? that. I do that three days a week. They're, they're really... Um, they've been amazingly flexible understanding employers from the off. I think they're aware that I've still kind of got a semi-active music career, been really accommodating about that. So mm. I do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday like that. And then Thursday, Friday, I try to get in the studio and, and do something. Uh, but you're right, you touched on it earlier. I, I, I've been doing quite a lot of stuff on my own and I find that, I don't find that as pleasurable as being in collaborative mm-hmm. relationships. So mm. trying to reach out a bit more, but that's been a real, issue with the pandemic you know yeah. it's been really frustrating i mean you can send stuff back and forth and that's fun but it's not quite the same as sort of being in a studio with somebody else sort mm. of knocking out ideas but yeah i do that thursday friday try to have a bit of fun on saturday and um because we've had no gigs it's been um mm. it's been very different that what happens everybody's going to want to know the answer to this question so let's get the question done yeah. when one of your patients realizes you're also well known in the music industry yeah. how do you manage that I mean, it's, it's odd because it, it's happened to me three times and, and, uh, and in quite different circumstances. So 
So I said I did my a lot of my hours at, uh, at King's College London, just working, you know, doing a couple of days a week. And a couple of times I got recognised. Uh, and that was sort of, sort of later in therapy. And I kind of felt like we'd done the work anyway. We were, we're the, they call it like blueprinting, where you're kind of sort of summarising what you've done together and trying to work out, anticipating things that might go wrong and, and, you know, planning for the future. And so at that point it was kind of fun and it was okay. And I was, but the other day, on literally my first session, somebody said to me, you're not, you're not that Tom Fillet who was, and she, would, she was exactly the same age as me. She still is. I'm still seeing her for therapy. We're just coming to the end of our work together. Um, and been around clubs, same time as me, and knew a lot of the same people I knew as well. So that was quite odd. I had to really kind of think on my feet and think, is this going to be okay? And actually, it was really fine. You know, like I think that it helped, it kind of helped us really build a sense of trust between us and a therapeutic relationship and all that sort of stuff. So I don't know if that one experience I had of it was absolutely fine. And I think mm. that, um, you know, we very quickly kind of established a sort of common language in terms of the things that we've done. And we could be quite honest about some of her past experiences as a result, which is mm. good. It's interesting, isn't it? Because therapists often um, try and appear as a tabula rasa or a blank screen. Yeah. You know, we're, we're anonymous. We don't have a particular personality we don't give too much away about ourselves mm. but I guess because people can look up look you up on Wikipedia yeah, yeah. Um, they probably feel like they know they could they know quite a bit about you mm. um, and the, what impact does that have on the therapeutic relationship and I guess it can go any which way can't yeah. it I mean I think that most people when they're the, the, in terms of my brief experience is that, that when they're coming to therapy they're so and that means a negative way, but they're so caught up in their own issues at that point. That's why they're coming to therapy and they've made that decision. They made a commitment to do it. They're not massively interested in you, apart from the fact that you can help them, really. And mm. that, that, you know, and sometimes I might bring in an, an experience I've, I've had myself if I feel that it's appropriate and would be helpful. But I don't think it's necessarily very helpful most of the time. So, and I find that most people, like, like I said, they're... They're much more interested. They want to spend that 50 minutes focusing on what their issues are, and that's totally fine with me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, you've been in the NHS now for just over a year, I think. Just over a year, yes. I started in July, yes. Yeah, so, I've become just so. I'm still provisionally rather than fully accredited mm -hmm. because I would have been, had my full accreditation, but then again got interrupted by the pandemic. So, I'm mm. allowed to reapply in November for my full badge. <laughs> yeah, so hopefully, I'll get it. And, um, but yeah, but I'm working as um, what they call like a band seven therapist. So I started as a six. So I'm pretty much as senior as I want to be in that, in my career. I'm not particularly interested in, in the admin side of things or supervision much. So I really admire people who do that, but mm. I enjoy the therapy and I enjoy that balance of having that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then being able to pivot into some music. And I don't see that changing really. Mm -hmm. Um, I think what's really interesting is this whole idea around purpose and, and how people um, who have a sense of purpose tend to feel better mm. uh, and, I, and it's a real resilience factor yeah. and I think over the last, um, through the pandemic we've seen a big change, we've, there was a big survey by um, Aviva, the insurance company, yeah. and they found that more and more people are wanting to turn, to, well first of all more and more people are questioning their current career. Right. And then the, um, there's a big trend towards people wanting to work in the kind of the helping mm. industry or mm. more person-centred work. Mm. Um, have you found that, have you noticed that amongst your, your musician friends or people talking about it? Yeah, I think so. I think that, um, you know, I think we've, certainly mine and Andy's experience has both been that. I would, I would sort of slightly caution, I mean, like, I really remember having, like a, as I said, a kind of a real existential crisis. And I think it's, if you can find that balance between the two, you know, like sometimes I think people maybe they move away from something they enjoyed and, and you know, and they move towards purpose because they feel that they want to be worthy or that somehow that's going to make I, I, the, the balance of having something that is sort of that you, you feel you're good at, that you can do easily, that comes naturally to you. I think that's nice to have that, too, because. I constantly feel, like much though I love the sense of purpose, I never feel like I ever know enough in therapy. I read constantly, and it doesn't matter how much I read, I never feel properly prepared for a session or that I ever have the answers. And maybe that's just the nature of something when, when people are, when I feel people are 
you know, reliant on you to some extent. Um, so I would enjoy that balance and if you're doing something that just feels instinctive and natural and a bit self-indulgent, which is the music, and then something where mm. it has sort of purpose and meaning and um, but brings with it a kind of a, a kind of a seriousness with mm. it, which can make me feel a bit anxious. You know, but I love that and I love learning and I love all that. But it's I've, I, there are, and, and, and I know that my sessions are better when I do the preparation. Actually, mm. I wish it would just come naturally, but it hasn't yet. But um, but that does yeah, it brings a, a different stresses, you know. Mm. So mixing it up, having the I think kind it's of... really great. Yeah, and in the same way that you would look for that balance in anything you do in your life, you know that you know that that kind of finding that balance of things of that, that you feel kind of rewarding and you know what they talk about like purpose, pleasure, mastery. You know, you want a bit of all of that stuff in your life, you know. Mm. And I think that's a it's a good mix to have. And I'm, but I'm with that all the way, and you know. It's another CBT thing that I said, you know, that might, so I find it a bit of an icky word. <laughs> having goals is mm-hmm. a good thing. Having something to move towards. So if you are feeling that your life is, is drifting a bit, then, that's, then goals are good, even mm-hmm. though I said it's a bit, uh, sometimes for a bit awkward when I why, say it. Why does it make you I feel I don't know, awkward? it's a bit sort of, you know, I don't know, there's, there's something about goals that makes me want to clap my hands and whoop. But I think <laughs> the, the notion of having something that you're focused on mm. and, 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 are, and are moving towards is something that's really helpful in mm. life, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So uh, thinking ahead and thinking about the fact that the music industry is waking back up or the, the performance part of it is, is hopefully mm. waking back up, uh, do you think you're going to be able to maintain the balance going forward? Yeah, I think two, so. The two careers. I think so, but I think that's partly down to the stage I am at in my career, you know, and so that, that you know, that both me and Andy fortunately have reached this point where we've found other things in our life that we're passionate about. Um, I'd say, Andy, I mean, Andy's hugely committed to this regenerative farming thing, but we both particularly love the sort of social side of what we do. Like, you know, you know the things that I really will always, you know, like getting on a plane flying out to Ibiza, having a lunch by the sea, doing a gig, often getting back on a plane the same day. This is easy jet, by the way, not a private jet. <laughs> I want to make it perfectly clear. But that stuff I, I mm. really love, you know. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, it, it, I think it's going to be manageable, but it wouldn't be manageable if I was doing my career like I was doing it 10 years ago. But mm. by doing it, I look at what next year holds in store, you know, <clears throat> you know um, touch wood or whatever. We're looking at some touring in April and May. It's the 25th anniversary of the band mm-hmm. and maybe six weekends of festivals next summer. Mm-hmm. Bit of rehearsals, but we haven't really changed the set a lot, so we don't have to rehearse too much. Um, and an album that's kind of written because it's, it's all these remasters, so we've gone back and, re, and re, rewritten all our old tunes. And we did all that work during the pandemic for something to do, so that was good. So everything's sort of done. So I think in a way, there are little times like now where I've got rehearsals coming, where I've had to get some time off work and it's been quite tricky. Um, particularly when, you know, maybe you're working with a patient who is, you know, quite reliant on you and maybe, you know, maybe their risk is quite high and you feel quite responsible for them. Trying to manage that where I don't leave them for two, three weeks. So it's maybe a week. And so that's been a bit Mm -hmm. tricky to organise. But I think I'm I'm managing it. We've got a question uh, from the audience that's just popped up on on the auto queue here. So... It says, what would you say to someone thinking of a career change but is worried to take a risk? Um, I would say, I'd, in a kind of quite a CBT way, I'd wonder what they were worried about, really. I would probably just go for it because I think, you know, I, I think that the worst you're going to do is find out that thing wasn't the thing you want to do. And the most likely thing is you're going to really enjoy it and, and find it exciting. And I think that the thing that... I've managed to do, and this is a bit of advice, I think is maybe don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So I think it was quite good that I managed to think, well, I'm going to do this. So like I was, my study was part time. Um, I could have done all these things in a year. I did it over two years. So, so, so I would, I would hundred percent go for it, but, but do it in a way that you feel is, you know, you can manage mm-hmm. you know, that transition in a way that's not going to make you feel more anxious or more stressed, you know? And we've got some more questions coming in from the audience as, as well. So okay. as they, they pop up, I... Oh, there are some here. Okay. <laughs> okay. Would you ever consider working in a service that's specifically for musicians? It's an interesting one because I have thought about this a lot. And, and when I worked at, um, in Hackney, mm. I think it was just sort of where the location was. I worked with a couple of musicians. And, and it was kind of really odd because obviously 
quite younger musicians and I sort of had all their experiences for about 10, 15 years longer than them and they kept telling me, talking me through like what a, what a gig was and all that sort of stuff and I had to really bite my lip and, but I was able to offer really good advice to them, you know, in terms of my experiences, particularly, you know, all the things about like managing the come downs after a show and a lot of the stuff of life on the road and all that experience. So it was really good. Like I felt like I could be a really good therapist to them and really support them. But I really, from a personal selfish point of view, I enjoy them being really distinct. And the thing I told you, like I, it's not easy. Like, you know, working in NHS is really not easy and you're carrying a lot of issues and you're dealing with people because it's in primary care and we're talking about, you know, you're doing screening calls and people can come in, you don't know what you're going to meet. You know, once you've seen your patients regularly, you do, but often you don't and you're not prepared for it. And, and that's a lot to carry, I think. And so I really value the fact that I can shut my work computer completely on a Wednesday and then just go and do music. And so I think with one bleeding into another, I think, I'm not sure that would quite work for me personally, but I can see, but I would, doesn't mean that for mm. another person, that wouldn't be something really useful. Mm. And it is, and I would say, it's a path a lot of people have, 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 are going down. I'm, I've noticed a lot of musicians who are now therapists, you know, we were talking about the slashies thing. And I think there's a lot, and I think that's partly one of the reasons why there's so much more discussion about mental health in the music industry because so many people are kind of doing that and coming back and bringing those skills back. So I don't think I'm needed. I think there's lots of people <laughs> that can do that job. You're quite happy with your compartmentalisation. My compartmentalisation, <laughs> yeah. Okay, we have another question that's okay. come up here. Do you ever use music as a tool for therapy itself in the yeah. same way that art is used as therapy? Yeah, I, 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 I don't. Um, I mean, I do personally, like, like for myself. Mm. I find, like I said, you know, it's kind of like, it has an enormous emotional impact on me. Like, um, but I would totally like if I was working with somebody and you know we were talking about, you know, they were feeling very anxious or depressed or something. I'd often, you know, totally would look at like what are the things that you know lift your mood or what helps you calm down or whatever. And then we would totally like if it is or if somebody loves music, let's try and get encouragement to go to a gig or join a band or connect with it in that way. So I would the way that music brings people together and, and that I would totally encourage, use that as, a, as part of my therapeutic process, but I'm not sure that I would tune into 60 hertz and sit around in silence for two hours. That's not <laughs> my vibe. Okay, another one that's coming through. What is the most standout live music performance you ever did and why? The one that we've ever done. I mean, there's, a, there's, there's kind of mad ones. There's sort of ones that are sort of stupid. I mean, the one that... I will always go back to, although I didn't enjoy it at the time, weirdly, because I was too stressed. <laughs> but was when we played, so there's, the, the Glastonbury has two stages, it has the main stage and the other stage. And traditionally, the other stage on a Sunday night is when the kind of a big dance act will close. It's like Massive Attack had played there, Chemical Brothers played there, Orbital, all these kind of Daft Punk, all these bands I looked up to. So closing the other stage, which we did in 2014, 15, was amazing. But actually, two years later, no, that was about, more, like, more like 2012, but actually two years later, and this is the Black Light record, the one I told you was a difficult record to make, was our best record. And I was probably coming out of that depressive cycle at that time and I've been really enjoying the band. We came back and we played the John Peel stage, which is obviously named in his honor. And it's a sort of new music, new bands kind of vibe. And we played that on a Saturday night. And that's like, even now, just thinking about it, I've got goosebumps because it was a kind of, it was a validation of that record and how much like, people enjoyed that record so much and people were singing along to the album and suddenly sort of this record that had been so difficult to make sort of meaning so much to people was um yeah that was an extraordinary gig so that one you can get it on iPlayer it's really worth the watch yeah, and it looks amazing I think I had shaved my hair off at that point I don't know whether I was having a, 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 a moment on, on tour of those but it's a that's a, a gig that like you know that just thinking about it can be triggering in a really positive way for me. It's a kind of kind of end of maybe end of that whole cycle, really. So did it did it feel like sort of putting something behind you, and letting yeah. go of something, or or was it giving birth to something? Yeah, or? all that bit a bit like you know like we talk about you know you have emotional experiences and you know the scars heal when they're still part of you, but they're kind of but you kind of absorb them into you as part of your history, and that was kind of. It's what, it wasn't like putting it behind me. It was about like absorbing that into my experience and saying that that was okay. And I went through that period and now I'm here. And even though it was an awful record to make, you know, sometimes when you're really struggling, good art can come out of those moments. So, so all of that stuff, I think it was a real, um, and you know, it was just, it was just a really mag magic gig and people still talk about it now. I mean, I get, 
I'm not very active on social media, not just not something I find helpful, but it's one thing that comes up all the time is about that gig and people's experience and memories of that gig. I think it was, it sort of was really memorable for the audience as well as, as us. It was one of the best gigs I've ever played. And we've been gigging, is the other thing, we've been playing for four months. So we were just incredibly tight. There's something about a band when you've just been doing that, where you're on stage and you just feel so comfortable with each other and you know everything that's coming up musically, you know you're never going to make a mistake. So you're just so, you're so at ease with the whole process. So the, the cloud had a really good silver lining, I think. Yeah, exactly, it really did, yeah. <laughs> so um, this is the last question I'm going to ask you from the audience. Sure. Um, so you mentioned advising young musicians about coming down from a live performance. Mm. What advice do you give? Well, I mean, I think it's... I think that, that I've... And this is like... I've done, I've done the, good, the, the good approaches and the less healthy approaches. I think there's a tendency when you're in that moment to want to try to sustain the peak you know so if you're on stage and people are cheering and everyone's staring at you and you're the center of attention and it feels fantastic and you played this gig and everyone loves your music nothing will ever feel as good as that and so accepting that accepting of that and having that moment and and then so if you go off stage and you start using whatever you use to kind of get you through the night and you do that to try to sustain that moment mm. at some point you're going to have to come to terms with that and the crash is going to be so much worse. So I definitely wouldn't go straight back to your hotel room because I don't think that's healthy either. And I think that's, I would find some way to be around people and enjoy that experience and so, sort of wind down. Yeah, have a drink, have a glass of champagne, do whatever you need to do, but probably don't look to find yourself in a nightclub two days later because that won't help. <laughs> <laughs> and I've no, been there. That's, <laughs> no, I'm sure. And it, and it, yeah, absolutely. So it's about winding down slowly and carefully, yeah, isn't it? So. And just yeah. accepting that was that. Yeah. That was amazing. Yeah. I'm not going to feel like that all of the time. You might feel happen. that tomorrow night because if you're lucky, you're on the road and you're doing that all over again. And actually, you're going to feel that more intensely and you're going to do a better gig if you can actually get yourself to bed by four o'clock and if you do a, do a rollover, as I say, in the music industry. Mm. And mm -hmm. people get away with that, but I, I, don't, I think you're cheating yourself and, and it's, it's not, mm. you can't do that forever. It's not a healthy mm. way to exist, you know? I'm just realising how much your career has taught you about, um, about how to manage yourself, yeah. actually. Yeah. And then the therapy skills and tools that you have layered on top of that. Yeah. Um, Kind of, kind of you, you, you know how to handle all of this now. When we were walking in Tile Yard here earlier, we were talking about returning to live performance and the kind of the little peaks of anxiety people are getting mm. about generally about going back into the real world and sure. meeting people and performing. And you know, necessarily there'll be a bit more adrenaline, and it might be for different reasons. It might yeah. be about the social activity as well as the performance. And, um, I'm just wondering if you were going to deploy all your skills yeah. <laughs> as you go out. Definitely. I mean, I, actually, really, I'm not a natural performer. I, don't, I, I feel anxious on stage, I, and it's one of those things that I don't feel, you know, so it's not like I feel socially anxious at all, but I, def, I, I don't love being on stage, but, I, but I'm fine with it. And I know that people tend, not to, they tend to be looking at the singers anyway, so it's fine, so nobody really cares. So I just get on with it. I enjoy the shows. I don't feel sort of really nervous and I've got a huge amount of confidence in the team of people we have around us and what we've done and we play so many shows I sort of know it's basically going to be okay so that's fine I find those skills more helpful for me in terms of when I have depressive symptoms I think that once you can find a way to distance yourself from your thoughts you know and and you know whether that's through mindfulness or you know this idea that you know these thoughts you're having that we talk about like being a feeling not a fact you know once you can recognize that these thoughts are not you and they're just one of millions of different theories and ideas and you've got around your life you know what's it we have sixty thousand thoughts a day and you can you can choose to tune into them you can choose to kind of wrestle them with like we do with cbt and dispute them or you can choose to step away from them like they do in something like acceptance commitment therapy or, or, um, or mindfulness, you know. But once you've got that, it's like a superpower. You know, you, 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 even when things are going badly, you can know that I won't be feeling like this in a couple of days' time. And if I do these things, this will help me. I need to just go for a swim. I need to put these things in place. And these thoughts I'm having about myself, I have these thoughts about myself when I've had a few late nights and I'm, something's come, you know. And so you, so that, that kind of, that way of having, yeah, you are not your thoughts kind of thing. I think it's a real kind of CBT superpower. And I, and I try, and I've, if, if I can, when I'm working with people, if I can get people to some sense of understanding about that, 
I think more than anything else, that's kind of, a, a, you know, a, an amazing skill, an amazing sort of toolkit to leave people with that they have a choice about whether to tune into those sort of, sort of thoughts. So um, it sounds like you're a great therapist. Uh, oh, you're going to have a that. massive queue. The <laughs> NHS waiting list is going to get longer, yeah. Tom, after this, I think. <laughs> I, I have my moments, but I'm definitely not all the time. And I think, you know, that's one of the things you, you know, it can be, it can be very tricky. And I think, you know, like for me, it's like, I'm, ha I'm comfortable with my, I've got, I've got my disorders that I'm good at and I've got things that I'm still, because it's the NHS, I'm still really finding my way with. So mm. um, yeah, mm. OCD, social anxiety, PTSD, not so good. Perhaps your supervisor's listening. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> no, we're working on it. <laughs> right, we've only got five minutes left. Okay. And so we're going to do the five questions. Yep. And you've got about 60 seconds per question. Okay, fine. Um, and the first question is about your, so, so, so not only are you a superpower therapist and uh, a well-known and brilliant musician, you're actually a very good footballer as well, aren't you? Well, not only more, but <laughs> <laughs> now they're nearly 50, but I'm, I'm, I, I played a bit when I was younger, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so tell us about why you love football. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I, I've always enjoyed it. I, actually, my, we were talking about earlier that uh, so my, my main team that I played for when I was in my sort of, when I was good and I could run around a bit in my 20s and 30s, a team called Hamilton Academicals, played just around the corner from where we're recording this on Market Road, which is our home pitch. I used to play midfield with Keir Starmer, who's now the leader of the Labour Party. And actually that's how I met Mike Daniels, who's the rapper on, or the singer on Superstyling and various other tracks. So that's how, it's a big part of Groove Midas history was that, was that, that team of people, really lovely group of people. So Mike played at the back with three of his brothers, me and Keir in midfield, managed by a guy called Phil and another guy called Gus. If they're in the route, I should name check them. But, and it, I love, you know, I love the game, obviously, and, you know, the endorphins and stuff you got from that and the sense of competition. But I love the camaraderie of it more than anything and a kind of mixture of, of kind of the people that, that something like football brings together. You know, you could have Keir in the centre of midfield with, with Mike, our rapper. It couldn't be any more different in a lot of mm. ways. So, um, yeah, no, it's been a huge part of my life. I still play every week, just about. And I guess, yeah, I, I just enjoy the experience of playing, but I also really enjoy the coffees afterwards and, and the kind of those, those experiences are great. Mm. So I suppose it's also a really nice way for, for men to come together and look after each other's yeah, well-being, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's a very yeah. supportive. The team I'm playing for now is really supportive. They talk about... You know, in, in, in again, we're talking mental health, CBT terms, they talk about this thing called flow. Yes. And we should all have a bit of flow in our life. And I think flow is about kind of when you lose yourself in something, you know, whether it's, you know, art. And I have my flow moments f fewer and further between now in football than I did before. But I have some flow in football. And obviously I have it sometimes when I'm playing music, when I'm playing the piano. And one day you'll have it in therapy as well. Yeah, it's not quite there. Sometimes. I have days when, I, yeah, when there's comes. some flow. It but comes. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so next question. Uh, you uh, obviously uh, are, uh, are completely embedded in music and you must listen to a lot of music and a lot mm. of diverse music. Um, tough question. What's your favourite track this week? Yeah, it's, it, uh, it, it's, it's weird. I do a show. I, I should give it a plug because I'm not sure anyone listens to it, but monthly I do a show on Soho Radio, uh, which again has been troubling, but I, so I do it all in my basement. I produce it all myself and cut it all together. And, and that's actually the part of the reason why I do it is because it, it forces me to listen to loads of new music, which I know I'd get lazy about. I just spend loads of time listening to 70s soft rock otherwise. So <laughs> it's good that it draws me towards that. Uh, there's a guy called Joel Culpepper that I did tracks with a couple of not great tracks, not his fault, my fault, a few years ago. And I see him a bit on the, on the sort of touring circuit. And he's got a new album out. There's a track, I think it's called Thought About You, um, that I played in the show last month that I love. And, and this is like a real step forward for him. He's a, you know, kind of a black British musician, does this kind of almost Curtis Mayfield kind of falsetto vocal thing. Um, yeah, big fan. It's just really nice when somebody you've sort of seen sort of working around the circuit and you know there's something there. And then they suddenly it all lands for them and delivers something. It's a really beautiful soul record. Mm. So, yeah, really recommend it. So one for people to listen to. Yeah. Good. All right. Next question is your own mental health. I mean, you've talked about it quite a lot, uh, which was very generous of you this evening. Mm. Um, but if you were to kind of name the thing that you're doing at the moment to keep yourself kind of robust and yeah. mentally healthy, what's your, what's your thing at the moment? Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, I mean, I'm quite sort of, I'm an active person, so that's important to me. I think you have to choose what works for you. Um, so I swim a lot. And I think swimming is lovely for me because it's, 
it's also deeply relaxing, you know. So I, I, I do a lot of that cycle and football. There, things that are really good for me. Um, I'm quite naturally an introvert, so I have to force myself, and that's because again, so I probably did a bit better in lockdown in some ways because I'm quite very, very comfortable in my own company. So for, forcing myself sometimes when somebody says you want to go and do this, and there's a part of me goes, no, I'm happy just <laughs> muddling around in the studio. So pushing myself sometimes, you know, we call it like suspending disbelief as a kind of thing in depression when people think I don't want to, I won't enjoy this. And you go, well, just suspend this belief, just do it and then come back and tell me, were you happy or you're not happy when you did it? And so I have to do that with myself all the time. So sometimes, like for example, I know that there's, we're all going to be playing rounders on Saturday with a, in a big family thing. So that sort of thing a few years ago, I'd be like, oh no. Uh, and I will force myself to do that and I will really enjoy it. And, mm. and I'll feel that sense of connectivity and I'll, I'll carry that through the week. Mm. So I think that's the thing that really helps me is like, pushing against my sort of introverted nature. Bit of sort of JFDI, just, just, exactly. just do it without yeah, the other words. Exactly, exactly. Um, so the future of Groove Armada, what's the big thing next year that we can all look out for? Yeah, so I mean, I think we're, we are, as I said, we're in the twilight of our career and really comfortable about that, you know, and, and I, I always said I didn't want to be 50 and hang around nightclubs, and next year I will be 50, <laughs> so I will be hanging around a few nightclubs. Welcome to my world. Yeah, <laughs> so, but hopefully not too many. Yeah. So I think we're going to do, so it's, it's all really neat, you know, so we are, it is actually the 25th anniversary the band mm. so it all makes loads of sense from when we released vertigo which is our first we did northern Star, but Vertigo is our first well-known record um so we re-recorded all the 25 originals that's then we're going to put it on an album we're going to do some touring not to go mad but like a bit of touring so we'll be lots of uk touring and kind of march april everything being equal and then some festivals in the summer and then that will probably be that for us in terms of a live thing, but we may come together. We went through a little period where we, we sort of went underground again and we made house records and we just messed about in the studio and that was really fun. And we might do that again in the kind of, in our dotage. We'll, yeah. we'll look out for the 25. Yeah, exactly. We'll look out for, if we do the 30th thing, then that's really not, <laughs> not on at all. And finally, uh, Tom, would you like to let us know which charity you'd like to donate your fee to tonight? Yeah, I mean, I think that even though I said to you that I want to keep kind of my music and my therapy quite distinct, there was a charity I came across called Music Support. Um, and I did a little bit of voluntary work with them, a bit of training, but actually it was a thing that made me think, I don't know anything about therapy. It was kind of what pushed me into to actually doing the CBT stuff. So and what they do is they have a kind of a 24 hour um, helpline for musicians, but also people working like, in, like techs, people working backline, stuff like that. So it's a really nice charity. I think they're trying to set up some sort of sites at festivals that people can also access and they can refer people or you know, be a kind of route map for people who come through that hotline to you know, link them up with, with different therapists in different areas. So really good charity and really happy to support them. So that's my one bit of awesome. not keeping my music and therapy distinct. <laughs> well, I'm glad we've encouraged that. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much, no, Tom. Pleasure. Thank you for joining us on Helios Spotlight. Thank you.